Hello, and thank you for joining us today for an Indian Business Incubators Program informational overview. I am Elwood Pipestem Ott, your webinar coordinator for today. Before we be begin, there are a few housekeeping items for our time together. All participants are muted and can enter comments in the chat box and questions. There will be breaks throughout the presentation today where we will acknowledge and speak to the questions in the comments. We will be monitoring it. So objectives of this session are to introduce the Office of Indian Economic Development, OIED, Division of Economic Development Staff and Technical Assistance Team share information about the Indian Business Incubators Program and be available to answer any questions you may have following the presentation. Out of curiosity, we have a brief poll to see where you all are with your IBIP application status. Please take a moment and answer the questions on the poll. So far we have five um, participants who have responded. Maybe we'll give it another few seconds for others to respond. Thank you, Makana. Okay, so uh, out of the five who did respond, all shared that they are not at all on their way towards finishing their application. Thank you all. We completely understand. Thank you. And hopefully, you know, we're able to provide some more information and get everything started. Patty, sorry that the poll disappeared from the screen. No worries. So moving right along, Denise Litz, the branch chief of the Office of Indian Economic Development, Division of Economic Development, will get us started today. Denise. Great, right, thank you, Elwood. Greetings all. My name is Denise Litz and I'm the chief for the Division of Economic Development in the Office of Indian Economic Development. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to our Business Incubators uh, webinar. Um, this is an opportunity for you to hear information about this grant opportunity, but I wanted to first give uh, a bit of information about our office and our team. So we were formerly known as the Office of Indian Energy and Economic Development, but we, um, the uh, Division of Energy and Mineral has since moved. And our goal is to support the economic development of American Indian and Alaska Native communities. And we do that through offering uh, access to capital through our grant opportunities and our loan guarantees. So um, we also offer um, technical assistance to federally recognized AIA and tribes. So we have two divisions in our office and I'm gonna talk about only one of those divisions, the Division of Capital Investment and the Division of Economic Development. Next slide, please. So within our Division of Economic Development, we have two teams. And these, these teams each cover something um, specifically different um, for our office. Uh, next slide, please. So the Economic Development Specialists that we have, they deliver virtual presentations so that we can expand the um, uh, awareness of our grant programs. And they do um, that for national and regional tribal events, as well as um, program overviews and how to apply for our grants and providing um, key dates and contacts. We also have set up this last year that they provide assistance and resources 
to any of the applicants that apply for our grants that do not get awarded. We understand that there's lots of resources available to tribes and tribal organizations, and we want to make sure that they get to net connected to all of the resources that are available if we are the ones that are not funding them. So we're happy to be able to provide that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our, our team for economic development specialists, myself as the chief for the division. Um, we also have our director um, who has been with us now for about two months and that is Anna LeBeau. And um, covering our Alaska and Southwest zone is Janelle Green. And our Northwest zone is covered by Jim Henry. We do have a vacancy right now for one of our positions and uh, Janelle Green is covering the Eastern zone. If you look on the map, you can see what states are covered and you'll notice that um, Hawaii is included in the, um, uh, in the Southwest zone. Um, for this particular grant opportunity with business incubators, Native Hawaiian organizations are not eligible, but we just wanted to mention that we do have one grant uh, availability through our Native Act that we serve and support Native Hawaiian organizations, but the other four grants do not. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was clear for this particular grant opportunity that we're talking about, um, Native Hawaiian organizations are not eligible. Um, so next slide, please. So our Office of Indian Economic Development also has a grants management team. So we have two individuals that support our grants. Um, Dennis Wilson is the grants management specialist and Monica Walker is our grants management contractor and they both support all five of our grant programs. Next slide, please. So we are fortunate this year, we were able to secure a technical assistance contract and we're very proud to have Tribal Tech supporting our office. Um, we have three team members that are working with us. Christine Celentano, who's the project manager. We also have Elwood Pipestem Ott, who's the technical assistance coordinator. And then Makana Riley is our technical assistance coordinator for Hawaii. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis. He's gonna start sharing about our business incubators program. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I should have started talking while I'm mute just to throw that in, throw that joke never gets old. Um, we're gonna do a high level overview today. Uh, thank you for everybody for being here. Um, I'm gonna have the next score of slides or so. So first and foremost, I wanna thank everybody who's been instrumental getting us to this point, Tribal Tech, putting this together, the entire OIED, DED team, uh, management, solicitors, um, again, everybody who got us to this point. Whereas, you know, most of the formation and implementation of this grant started before uh, any of us were here, really. Uh, it speaks to the collective interpretation of the act and the overall intent of the program. So, and apologies in advance if I throw out a ton of acronyms and um, if you, please ask if I just kind of breeze over some of those and I'll be reading some script, some talking off the cuff. So apologies as you follow along as I jump around. So good, I was gonna say next slide. So the act I'm referring to is a native business, the Native American Business Incubator Act of 2020. That's public law 116-174. Uh, that was, that developed into the proposed ruling in April of 2021. That followed with uh, numerous tribal consultations that summer of 2021. Then finally, the final rule was kicked out in September and that was 25 USC, 1187. So for those of you that have been watching and commenting on the progression of the act to the proposed to the final ruling, um, we're here now. So as you read the NOFO, um, and you're going to see a lot of similarities in all those documents as they produce the NOFO. Um, similar wording from top to bottom, if not outright lifting Wording. But that's what you do when you don't have the implementing regulations yet. So that's forthcoming. That'll be at 25 USC 5804. So again, this is going to be just a high level overview uh, of the program itself, the application requirements, some mandatory points, and we're not going to dive into much heavy specifics of the budgeting or project details. Um, 
And for those of you that are familiar with OIED and our NOFOs and our all our five grant programs now, five grant, five grant programs, uh, we strive to allow as broad a canvas as possible. Um, I, we feel that's that allows us to meet each of the applicants at their present capacity and that they could take these grants to where they need to go uh, within the confines of 2 CFR 200, the overall intent of the individual grant program, et cetera. But um, a lot of times we do want a full list of do's and don'ts, can and can'ts, um, allowable versus unallowable. And we'll try to get to some of those questions, but most of that, just like the project and the budgeting, it's gonna be on the applicant themselves. Um, again, the overarching regulations are 2 CFR 200, the Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, Auto Requirements for Federal Awards. That's what we're going by. And with that, in the spirit of that, you're going to hear a lot of necessary and, re necessary and reasonable, a lot. Um, it's the driving sideboards for what is and isn't allowed. And um, like that statement at the bottom in uh, capital letters, the program goal is to inject economic life into reservations and tribal communities. That's where we're going with this. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so how are we gonna do that? We're gonna do that by funding incubators. Um, again, our goal is gonna be impact, stimulate, inject e economic life into those communities by way of establishing business incubator locations those will in turn provide the necessary skills uh, to start up businesses, entrepreneurs in education, workspace or facility, networking, mentorship, all of those things that are needed to service those identified reservation communities and just reservations. Um, so we are pointed, calculated, engaging, and hopefully this will become measurable here by the end. Next slide, please. So the big question, the big hurdle, eligibility. We do not provide pre-eligibility determination for those who are familiar with our programs. It's just uh, one of those things we cannot do. So <clears throat> what we do have, and this is the by far the largest eligibility um, group out of all the rest that we have. We typically just have one and two uh, federally Indian recognized tribes. And that's found at 87 FR 4636, and that's updated yearly. Um, tribal organizations is now currently 25 USC 5304L. Uh, don't worry about these, we'll, uh, we'll kick all these out. Um, but those are pretty much the number one and two for most of our grant programs. For this one, we keep going further. We have numerous tribal colleges and universities and institutes of higher learning that have their own unique criteria. Uh, one of, and there's a lot of citations for those. There's also, it, it also has to be operational for not less than one year. And that goes the same with tribal profit and or nonprofit and private nonprofit organizations. Those also have to be in operational not less than a year. And lastly, the ability to come in together and submit a joint application which the only real requirement there is you have to identify everybody involved and each of them have to be individually eligible. So you can't pull a rider on. So the last three to six have to be operational, not less than a year. That is statutory as well. So uh, that's why that language is in there. So if you're eligible for one or more, please just demonstrate that, provide the justifications, documentation, legal counsel, uh, whatever you need to demonstrate your eligibility. Uh, next slide, please. And a little bit about the high levelness of this program. It's the CFDA number 15.032, economic development. Uh, next year, that goes for most of our OIED programs. We're probably going to apply for more of those, but for right now, that's it. Um, the award ceiling is currently 300,000, and we highly suggest you try to go for that uh, and that is an annual payment. So over the three year term, it would be 300,000 annually. Uh, this is a 36 month duration term. Uh, again, something new with BIA. And however, as you can see at the bottom, we will be, it must be done 
in yearly program budget and review increments. So whereas it is a three-year program and it should overall be treated as such, we are breaking this up into yearly increments. So make sure everything as, we're, as we talk going forward in these slides speaks to yearly budgeting, yearly project um, developments and goals and, and objectives and so on and so forth, because that's gonna help our internal review. And we'll get to that here in a bit. Uh, and before I go to the next slide, um, we do wanna caution the difference between an FOA and a NOFO, or a FOA and the NOFO, yeah. A notice of federal, notice of funding opportunity. That's what we produce in-house. That's what gets reviewed. The solicitors at management, top to bottom, that's what gets approved. We take that document, we go into grants.gov by way of grant solutions, and we insert it in a certain processy form in pieces. So that form that gets kicked out, that's called the funding opportunity announcement. That's a grants.gov production. And that's where you see some kind of inconsistencies, conflicting headings, uh, differences in, in, in that format. So when in doubt, feel free to ask, but reference the NOFO. And if you read the FOA in entirety there, I don't know how many times you put it in there, read the NOFO, look at the NOFO. Um, what I highly suggest is read the act, read the final rule, go through all the comments section. There's a lot of great information in there. Uh, read the FOA, read the NOFO, just become familiar with all of that. And then you should be pretty much good to go. Next slide, please. So we'll get into the application pieces now. Um, and you can see those on the right there. The one that's different if you've applied recently is the F SF424 It is now version four, not three. So make sure you're in four because that does require the UEI number um, versus the DUNS. So be cognizant of that. And we'll break these up and go through these fairly quickly. <clears throat> Next slide, please. We'll start with the cover page. Okay, is that me? Captions and subtitles. Okay. Um, there's a list here of what should be in the cover page. So please have the CFDA number, the title, the total funding request amount, including the non federal share match requirement, full and proper name, uh, the statement of the proposed work, more or less kind of the mission statement of what you intended and proposed to do. Uh, you do need to be a confirmation statement that you're registered in SAMS and try to provide that within the body of your application. Um, if you have an ASAP with another, another organization, make sure you have a BIA ASAP and that takes three to four weeks. So if you do not have that, now is the time um, and you should be able to get that fairly quickly. And the confirmation of other mandatory components and be cognizant of the difference in the section headings in the FOA and the NOFO reference the NOFO, um, but they should speak to the same. And identification of any partnerships such as tribes, tribal orgs, entities, and partnerships outside the joint application. Put everything in there. Uh, next slide, please. Cover letter. So please keep it to one page and it's gonna summarize the intent and interest um, of the program complete with authorized signature and organizational leadership. Um, you're going to see a lot of circular referencing through this presentation. You keep coming back and speak to the same things. And some things like the abstract can kind of go in multiple pieces. But tribal resolutions, real quickly, that is not a requirement for this grant. Uh, this grant. It is for our other grants. So um, it's mostly due to the logistics of potential multiple reservations, targets, the different native businesses and entrepreneurs that may or may not align. So the good news is it's not required. However, if you have one, if you can get one, please submit that. Um, you can't beat that support as well as any other support letters, but tribal resolutions are, are, are the gold ticket. So if possible, get it. Um, as you're gonna see and read through this, you're building your case. So you're gonna be demonstrating your eligibility, stating what you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it, budget and detailed and itemized support with your project alignment to two CFR 200 yearly as you go through the three-year term. Um, so 
start with the cover letter, start with the cover page and, and move forward. So next slide, please. Project Abstract, this is new. Uh, this is a grant solutions kind of kick out and it's just a pretty much a paragraph. I can't remember how big it can get, but you can fill this out online. And as project title, a basic description of the proposed business incubator location, services provided, um, anything that's gonna be kind of identify your project in such a way um, in case it needs to be distinguished, but if not just a base summary. Next slide, please. So the project narrative, and this is the next four or five slides. So we're gonna kind of break this down. Um, this will be more intensive, engaged every step of the way uh, than other grant programs. Everything from our application and review process through, through the yearly um, reviews that we're gonna do. So everyone that does get awarded through this grant, we're gonna be uh, intimate. So uh, just unlike our other grants where you know, we'll check in, we'll do uh, proactive check-ins, but otherwise this one will be more intensive. So uh, some highlights of this slide are certify and provide el your eligibility, um, who you're gonna have as far as your management and executive director, program manager, those are gonna manage the program. You're gonna also agree, agree to a site evaluation. And as much as we would like to do that physically, we'll probably do that via Zoom or, or another uh, deal. And that's gonna be part of the selection process. You're gonna also agree to annual programmatic and financial examination um, and through the duration of the grant and to the maximum extent possible, be able to remedy any problems identified in the evaluation or the examination um, as you go. So, and also, and this is key, a description of one or more reservation communities that are gonna be served by the big business incubator. Again, the overarching goal of this program is to stimulate those economies in those identified reservation communities. And no better place to do that is by the entrepreneurs and businesses that service that community, not exclusively, but um, majoritively service those communities. So they need to be identified. Um, information demonstrating the effectiveness and experience of the actual applicant. You're demonstrating your quals, qualifications to be able to conduct financial management and marketing assistance programs. We're gonna get into some of those slides to educate and improve the business skills of current and prospective businesses, working in and providing services to the native communities, provide assistance to entities conducting business in those communities, providing technical assistance under business and entrepreneur development programs for which native businesses and entrepreneurs are eligible, managing finance and staff, staff effectively. So as you can see, there's a wide range of opportunity here. So touch on all of it, uh, focus on it when you can, um, leave no stone unturned, explain everything, itemize. Unlike other areas, the more you demonstrate, the more you explain, the less questions that come up because it is on the applicant to demonstrate everything. Next slide, please. This is a three-year grant, but it may be well to look at it as three one-year plans, uh, yearly milestones, yearly budgets. Um, as you can see from uh, some of the bullets on the side there, uh, identify the number of participants that are going to be in the incubator program number of businesses that you plan to help start. Um, what is the business, what is the incubator gonna focus on the particular types of businesses, industries, et cetera. Um, businesses and entrepreneurs participating in the incubator, the breakdown of those, and those that are not participating in the incubator but receiving services, we call those walk-ins. Those that are gonna walk in and just want some help and, uh, and hopefully get it. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so you're going to be providing information that's going to support, uh, support the effectiveness and experience of the applicant, applicant across the business realm. Um, conduct programs designed to educate and improve business skills or current prospective businesses. So you're, you're, you're demonstrating across the board that you can provide those services, not just be 
pointed for no other reason than you can't. So um, you are going to be providing those milestones and projected outcomes, and you need a site designated location for this. So the site location, it must be a physical location. Uh, you do not have to be in possession of it at the time of application, but it states in the final rule that it must be secure when services are provided. It also states services must be provided prior to the three month mark. Now, does that coincide? I would like it to think so, but demonstrate if for some reason you can't. We understand this is, well, the act, the proposed rule, the tribal um, consultations, all of that was done during COVID. So we, we understand the challenges on securing leases before you know you're awarded. So all of that was built into this program so that you don't necessarily have to have it at the time of application, but you need to demonstrate that there's that, um, and what is the word, uh, commitment. It is committed that it will be there. So there is some leeway, but that three month mark to provide service, that's statutory. That's 25 USC 5803. 5803B1C. So some important things to remember as we're closing out the narrative, it cannot exceed 50 pages. So if you need to use, if you have supplemental information, data, graphs, charts, please throw that in the addenda, the, the appendix, uh, throw it in the back. So uh, try not to get over that 50 page mark, please. Next slide. Continuing with the narrative. Um, you do want to address these areas, and we're going to kind of touch on each and spe uh, specifically financial and management education, marketing education, mentoring and access, technology. Um, so let's start going through those. Next slide, please. Oh, question check. Does anybody have any questions off the bat? Yeah, we have a bunch of questions, Dennis. Um, I'll start reading them and I'll leave you spotlighted for now. I think you'll answer most of them. So first off, uh, is a native-led nonprofit eligible? Good question. Please demonstrate that in your application. <laughs> uh, we can't provide any pre-eligibility determinations, even if some of them are no-brainers. And I would love to just say yeah uh, or no to save people some time. Uh, just read the definitions, uh, highlight how you are, how you meet those requirements. And if you meet more than one requirement, it'd be safe to demonstrate that as well, uh, that you come in under different definitions. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. And then um, similarly, are there eligibility requirements set out in this grant that a business or individual must meet in order to receive services from the incubator? That will be in the applicant's criteria for how they're selecting those into their competitive incubator program. Um, so it will be on your, at your purview to, to uh, determine that. So you have free realm. Uh, we just wanna see one because there will be this differentiation between those that are in the competitive program that are gonna get, you know, really shoulder to shoulder working um, access, training, uh, that curriculum, uh, all the way through to the type of graduation. And then there's those, then there's going to be those that are just simply walk-ins or, you know, infrequent, or they just don't want to commit uh, that, that just want to have that help. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Um, and then this might be for the larger team. Uh, there's a few people wondering if the slides and the presentation or maybe the recording is going to be available uh, maybe online for people to access. Sure. Somebody want to take that one? Oh, sure. This is Christine. Um, we'll make the, the slides, the, the PowerPoint presentation available um, within a couple of weeks and then the recording within a week. Um, we have to make sure that it's compliant to be online first, but yes, all this will be made available both at the, um, and we'll talk about it later, the training and technical assistance website and on the Office of Indian Economic Development's website as well. So thank you for the question. Okay, um, and then next up, I think this is probably back to Dennis. Uh, who regulates 
the oversight and what happens if the incubator determines the business is not in compliance? That would be, uh, the point of the sword would be OIED. Uh, we're gonna rope in some such matter experts in the review process. However, as going forward, we will be managing the grant. We will be managing the individual awardees, uh, ranking them against their own proposal, their own time, timelines, milestones, project goals, and then going forward, um, trying to correct any issues. Um, if you've run into, you know, COVID variants, uh, anything that really kind of hits the, the incubator in the head and that we need to kind of rearrange or, or readjust, uh, we'll be able to do that on the fly, hopefully. And um, uh, nobody's gonna be out of compliance because we're gonna be working hand in hand and we're gonna be uh, following, crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's, so um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Um, for the number of native businesses and native entrepreneurs who will participate, are these projections or actuals? I think this is in reference to some of the numbers that you were sharing earlier. Projections. Um, everybody's going to be different. Everybody, meaning applicants. There's going to be some giant applications with a lot of beef to it, a lot of moving parts. Then there's going to be though that are smaller, and uh, everybody gets their due. Uh, we're not here just for um, the highest capacity tribes, we are a capacity building organization. So ideally, we would love to see incubators from Florida to Alaska, everywhere in between, ideally in different locations servicing multiple reservations. Um, uh, that would be the dream. But otherwise, no, uh, it, those numbers are on your own prior research into putting in this application based on population, servicing those socioeconomic factors like population and, and, and the diversity within that organization or community, so on and so forth. Okay, just a couple more and then we can um, get back to our slides. Sure. <clears throat> uh, are there funds for administrative services or technical assistance? Say that again, please. Sorry, McKen. Are there funds available for, oops, sorry. Are there funds available for administrative services or technical assistance? And Donna, yes, I saw that pop up. That is the one. Um, but um, to that question, uh, administrative threw me because for this grant, for most all of OIED grants, um, administrative costs, and indirect costs are not allowable. However, you can direct charge. So there is that ability. You just need to be on point with that. Um, there is administrative allowances towards your selection and review of those that are gonna be included in your incubators, incubator program. And um, I wanna say staff, but I, I don't quote me on that right now, but in general, Stay away from administrative and um, IDC. Okay, and then um, can we use the grant funding to lease a building? You can use um, lease as in kind um, for sure, uh, 2 CFR 200 306. Um, that would fulfill the match requirement. Um, and that would be first, that would go first um, versus using it as funds and um, forgive me I usually have all the nofos and 2 CFR 200 memorized but right now I'm drawing a blank if if that is allowed uh, let me circle back on that okay uh, and just double checking for someone is the grant that we're talking about BIA IBIT 2022 OIED yes okay. that was Donna's Last one, I think, um, regarding cost sharing or matching requirement, is in-kind matching allowed? Yes, it is. Um, and there's a wide range of applicability for that. Um, value of the lease. Uh, and then we, I mean, we could spend hours talking about that, but yes, short answer is yes. 
Okay, I think uh, moving on to slide 23, I think we're going to be switching over to Christine. I will- I think this is still me. Not yet. Oh, sorry, this is sorry. Not yet. No, that's fine, that's fine. So um, a little bit into the business skills and training and education in the incubator program. Um, offering culturally tailored incubation services that was lifted from the act. I, I, I always point that out every time we went through this, that I like that word uh, culturally tailored because it is different. They're all going to be different. But when you're dealing with um, these communities that do things a certain just different way, um, having it tailored to that is, is, is great. Um, you will be using a competitive process for selecting native businesses and native entrepreneurs that you're going to be determining. And um, awardees, may, and you may still may offer that technical, some technical assistance and advice to businesses and entrepreneurs on a walk-in basis. Um, provide a physical workspace that permits native businesses and native entrepreneurs to conduct business and collaborate with other native businesses and native entrepreneurs. That's the physical workspace. Next slide, please. Financial education, uh, the training and counseling can include, but obviously not limited to, applying for and securing business credit and investment capital, preparing and presenting financial statements, managing cash flow and other financial operations of a business. And before I go to the next slide, because my, my mind likes to jump around, there is, it clearly states in the final rule uh, at the very end, I think it's uh, number 0.52, that you, we will work with our sister DOI agencies and cabinets. So I highly recommend you point that out on your application if you intend to do so. Um, you're basically doing it for the rest of us, roping in, roping in Secretary of Ag, Commerce, Treasury, SBA, HUD, EDA, all of these organizations to uh, communicate, collaborate, reduce overlap, um, that increased communication, access to these groups, access to that kind of capital, uh, that'll do nothing but propel your incubators that are in your program forward. Uh, rising tides lift all ships. So I, I think that's, that's going to be key if you can do that. Next slide, please. Management, uh, training, counseling, and planning, organize, organization, staffing, directing, controlling each major activity or function of a business or startup. I like that last bullet because you're helping them beyond what they already know if they've already been established. You're helping them meet the needs, the challenging needs to operate in these reservation communities where uh, their success is, is not high. So by being included in your incubator program, you're automatically up in their, their rates of success, which again, stimulating that, that economy. Next slide, please. Marketing. Uh, training and counseling in, identifying and segmented domestic and international market opportunities? No, the answer is gonna be no to the question of, do those in the incubator that are gonna be admitted into the incubator program, do they have to service those identified reservation communities exclusively? No, uh, you are helping them grow, you're helping them uh, develop and, and, you know, after this program, they're going to be going on to bigger and better things. So obviously, they shouldn't be exclusively tied to only servicing these communities. However, since the overall goal is to stimulate those communities, it should be a major focus, and it should be part of your selection criteria as an opinion. Um, and then the next bullet points, preparing and executing marketing plans, locating contract opportunities, negotiating those contracts or any contracts and using varying public relations and advertising techniques. Next slide, please. And mentoring and access, I think this is easily said, but easily one of the highest points is to provide that direct mentorship and assistance, be there. Uh, mentorship in the, in, in the industry that they're in, uh, that they intend to operate in, or they intend to branch out into, uh, provide access to those networks and potential investors, professionals in the same or similar fields, other business owners, similar businesses, conferences, training, uh, just throw them in, uh, get them well acquainted with what's out there, broaden their minds, uh, still 
stimulating those reservation communities, but um, doing what you can to up their success rates. Next slide, please. And then technology. Uh, of course, everybody that walks in or those that are in the incubator program should have access to the newest software hardware, where we're going. Uh, everything you know is now online, whereas just how many years ago it wasn't. So everywhere that the, the markets are going, uh, they should be able to uh, tap into those tools and to compete and thrive. Next slide, please. And additional items to consider, um, a description of the project objective and goals for each of the three years. Yes, we are breaking that down uh, into one year increments and then the total. Uh, be cognizant of deliverable of products that the grant expects to generate. Interim deliverables such as status reports, technical data, final deliverables, those will be spelled out in the award letter. Um, but since we're gonna be talking so often and on a yearly basis, you'll be well aware of those. Uh, provide the resume of key consultants and personnel to be retained, if available, in the names of subcontractors, if available, uh, just spell all that out, provide all that, let us know what you're doing, who you're doing it with, and um, that'll satisfy that. And then please use a descriptive file name, uh, the name and convention there, IBIP, narrative, dot, tribe, your, you know, organizational name, dot project, excuse me, and that'll be great. Next slide, please. And this, at this point, I'm gonna take a break and Christine will be covering these and then I'll come back later with the criteria. Thank you. Thanks, Dennis. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, so now to the good stuff, the money part. <laughs> um, okay, so with the, we're gonna start with the budget and that includes line item budget and the budget narrative. Um, the project budgets for the initial period only, the, typically the first 12 months of the project and entered into the SF-424A, otherwise known as the budget information standard form. The budget justification consists of the budget narrative and a line item budget detail for the first budget period of the project, <clears throat> the proposed project and includes calculations for each of the object class categories identified in the budget information standard form and discusses the necessity, reasonableness, and allocation of the proposed cost. Next slide, please. Applicants are required to submit a budget using the SF-424A form. Um, use, a, again, a descriptive uh, tribal uh, a name, a descriptive uh, file name that includes the tribal name and the project description. Um, for example, it might say IBIP budget dot tribal name and then the name of your project. Um, when preparing budget information for the SF-424 and the 424A, applicants should plan to apply for funding in the range of one hundred to $300,000 a year for three years. Um, there's a link on the slide, and the link will get you to the IBIT NOFO package and to access the SF-424A, and it's, it should be placed in the chat for you to access. So this is a sample of the first page of the SF-424A, and I just want to mention that where it's highlighted in the form, um, you are able to get directions on what should go in there, so you actually hover over the highlighted box, and once you stop your mouse or cursor, it will, the directions will just pop up, which is pretty nice. You can also find detailed instructions for the SF-424A and the SF-424 in grants.gov under um, family of forms. And if you go to that tab, um, you will be able to find very detailed instructions for these two forms we're gonna go over here. Next slide, please. So this is page two, and you can see the object class categories are here. Um, there's personnel, fringe, travel, equipment, supplies, any contractual services. Um, construction and indirect charges are not gonna be something you fill out for this program. 
but that it will appear in the form. You just won't have anything in those columns or those line items. Next slide, please. This is page three of the form. And you can see where you'll be entering your federal and non-federal amounts in the middle of this form. And you'll be doing that by quarter. And I highly recommend you think about how much indirect you'll need for each quarter and put that in realistically so that as your projects are monitored throughout the year, you don't fall behind on your in-kind because everyone thinks it's easier to just make them quarterly amounts. So if you're, if you're putting 100,000, for example, and if you put 25,000 in each of those quarters, you may not make that in your first, you may not make that commitment in your first quarter. So be realistic and think about where the amount you agree to commit to the project fits into each of those quarters and into that in that form. Next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about the budget narrative. Next slide. Okay, so with the budget narrative, you're gonna to want to include a comprehensive breakdown of all projected expenditures. Uh, budgeted items must be necessary, relevant, and reasonable as they relate to the business incubator project proposal. Anything found in the budget must directly tie back to an activity expense proposed in the project. So um, be careful not to include anything rogue that doesn't tie back to the proposed project and its objectives and activities. There should be a nice um, alignment between your project narrative, your line item budget, and the budget narrative you provide that would tie all the way back to the activities and the narrative you have outlined for your project proposal. So you, you should find these expenses in each part of your, each section of your application. Um, so demonstrate and combine the first three items that I just discussed to provide a budget justification for proposed project expenditures. Next slide, please. Okay, so some of these uh, comprehensive breakdown of, of these anticipated expenditures include contracted personnel fees, consulting fees, hourly or fixed, travel costs, data collection and analysis costs, computer rentals, report generation, drafting of agreements, for example, and advertising costs for a proposed project and any other relevant project expenses in their project subcomponents. Next slide, please. Someone asked about administrative costs. Um, you should include administrative costs associated with search, review, and selection of external hires, including administrative support and supervision of liaisons. Organizational administrative costs, other than those that are described that I just read here, um, are not allowed. Salary and fringe benefit costs will be coordinated with OAED to ensure salary costs are reasonable and relatively consistent across the liaison network nationwide. Travel costs should be itemized by airfare, vehicle, rental, lodging, and per diem based on the current federal government per diem schedule. Data collection and analysis costs should be itemized in sufficient detail for the OIED Review Committee to evaluate the charges. Other expenses may include, and I talked about this earlier, uh, computer rental and advertising costs for the proposed project. Match requirements are at 25% of the grant amount requested and must also be documented as outlined in the IBIP NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity. Next slide, please. So um, we're gonna talk about non-federal share and like Dennis said, we could talk about it all day long, but we'll, we'll just go over a few things here. So the primary recipient is responsible for the full amount of the non-federal match proposed, including any amount provided by one or more third parties as listed in the standard form SF-424, application for federal assistance. Whereas the full match contribution does not 
need to be in hand as of the date of the application, the application must provide commitments for the non-federal contribution throughout the term of the grant. Applications may meet the required non-federal cost share or match through in-kind contributions, which must be necessary and reasonable for accomplishing the proposed project objectives. Applicants must include a description of the non-federal contributions in an amount equal to and not less than 25% of the grant amount requested or submit a waiver, a waiver request. Next slide, please. So we're continuing here. Um, the applicant must describe and attribute fair and equitable market value per 2 CFR 200.306 to any in-kind match proposed in lieu of cash, which may include, but isn't limited to, um, allowable costs under 2 CFR 200 subpart E, cost principles, uh, must occur within the, re the period of performance of the award, and cannot be paid from or sourced from other federal funds, programs, or grants, or documented in project records related to those grants, and must not be used as a match with any other grant. Next slide, please. Value of services and property donated per 2 CFR 200.306. So that's a really good, if you're not familiar with the 2 CFR 200, um, that's a great place to become familiar when you're putting your budget together. Um, so some examples are, and Dennis mentioned this a little bit earlier, space is measured by the value of rent, uh, materials and equipment, donated services and technical assistance, um, payroll or volunteer services from personnel working on the incubator who are not funded by IBIP must be well documented and supported per methods used for regular personnel costs. So in other words, if you have someone on your staff that's donating their time, um, you'll want to show that in the form of their regular salary, the percentage of time they commit to the project and show that calculation and how much money then is um, committed to this project as an in-kind service. Contributions from a third party per 2 CFR 200.434. A third party is an individual or organization other than the eligible applicant, such as a partner that is not receiving grant funds. And then uh, projected earnings through the term of the grant. So if you anticipate any projected earnings, you would um, go ahead and, and describe what you believe they will be, and you will be pouring those, because you're all gonna do amazing work and, and, and establish all this funding, pouring it back into your project so that it can continue and sustain. Next slide, please. So applicants are required to complete the SF-424, version four, as Dennis mentioned earlier. And again, uh, please use a descriptive file name as shown here. So you're actually identifying IBIP, SF-424, and then you know your name and then the project name. The SF-424 form requires congressional district numbers of the applicant. And they can be find, found at the link here on the slide. And we can put that link into the chat as well. You'll see that, um, next slide, please. <laughs> You'll see here as we go through the SF-424 uh, where that actually comes up in this form. So the next three slides will show the SF-424. The highlighted area shows where to input the requested information. And as I mentioned before, this form in the SF-424 um, have instructions on how to complete the forms and they're easily uh, found and ready to download in grants.gov. Also provided within grants.gov are detailed instruction boxes. So I described it earlier, if you were to click, hover over this highlighted area and stop your mouse or cursor, the instructions pop right up, which is pretty nice. The circled area on here just shows the difference in this version four form with a unique entity identifier, and you need to include that number. Um, if you need to know how to get that number, you don't have it yet, you register for that through sam.gov. Okay, next slide, please. 
This is page two. So I'm basically just showing you what this looks like for those of you that have never filled these out. And you can see the highlighted areas. And again, same, same situation. Just hover over and you can get the instructions on how to fill those out. Next slide, please. This is page number three. And that area at the top there, circled in red, is where the congressional district information goes. And there are instructions here. So again, if you hover over the highlighted area, it will tell you how to uh, document your congressional district information right in those boxes, which is pretty cool. And then uh, if you have more, if you plan on covering more than one congressional district, your opportunity to include that information is here on this form at the top. Next slide, please. Okay, it's time for questions. Okay, just a few questions, Christine. Um, so just to clarify, even though the budget, sorry, even though the project period is 36 months, a budget and budget narrative are only needed for the first 12 months. Is that correct? So um, in the forms, you will fill out the first year um, of your budget. You do have to include three each of three years, but you have to do it in 12 month periods. So um, you'll do your first year, you'll, you'll develop a budget narrative for that year, you'll fill out your forms for that, for that year. Um, and Dennis, maybe you can elaborate, but I believe that they need to submit three years of budgets in 12 month increments. And that's correct, right? You were doing great, Christine. Okay. Okay, one more question. Um, for an annual grant of 300,000, would the salary paid by the tribe for a program manager of 75,000 meet the 25% match requirement? So, um, I'll, I'll tag team with Dennis, but I'm, I'm interpreting that question as you have someone on staff already, um, that's their salary amount. And I don't know if that's their salary amount or if that's their salary amount plus fringe. And you're wanting to dedicate someone you already have on staff full time as a match. And if I understood that right, maybe someone could put a thumbs up or something. It's pretty close with fringe, I would think. Um, just make sure it lines up. Like Christine was already probably jumping in here and she already had it covered. Oh, but, please do. You yeah. know, 2 CFR 200, 306, 2 CFR 200, 434. Um, make sure it's identified, um, itemized, uh, categorized correctly as an object class code and in all the forms. Um, but yeah, however you come up with that match through in kind, through straight cash, yeah, that you're you're good. I think I drifted from the question, but and I think yeah. no, that's 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 good, Dennis. Um, I think uh, Deborah, the question was from Deborah, and she said it actually be a new position. So as long as you're not spending or or concluding the new position in your actual budget for IBIT. Um, but as a separate organizational position that would be applied as match, sure, that works. And be cognizant of who the applicant is. If it's not the tribe and it's donated from the tribe, but the tribe isn't the applicant, reflect that accordingly. Um, we, I mean, we anticipate there's going to be questions in the budget here and there. Uh, that way, that's why we say explain everything all the way down to the dollar. Uh, don't lump sum anything and just say supplies. You know, we'll break those down as, as, as much as you can, but um, we will come back and discuss if we need. Okay, that's it for the questions. Um, so we're moving on to slide 46. And I think, are we moving to Dennis? Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. That was great. She had the hard work. The budget's always what it comes down to, um, more so than the overall goals, which are not, not simple, but coinciding those budgets to those goals is. Um, delineating those goals through the budget 
as a deliverable certainly is. So um, at this point, you've put together your application, you've filled out all the forms, some online, um, you've uploaded some, and now we're down to the ranking uh, evaluation. This is where it gets exciting for us because in a lot of ways, it takes a lot of pressure off. We have a lot of those subject matter experts that are gonna be on the review panel, the objective re review panel, um, that are gonna see through the lens, we're gonna be able to see through the lens of those that have actually done this and been there. So I'm sure they're gonna come up with a lot of questions we didn't even, we couldn't even begin to see. Um, whereas our nose is to the grindstone, making sure we're, we have a compliant program, uh, adhering to 2 CFR 200, uh, we could get lost in the weeds of that as well. So to have these folks really, really look at these applications is gonna be, it's gonna be great. So for those of you that have uh, done some night reading and went through the final rule, you're gonna see straight crosswalking of a lot of these. Um, uh, the point systems obviously not, but the criteria and the sections sometimes lumped together, uh, you, it's gonna read similar. So um, the narrative, number one, Let's talk to that first box, the description. Next slide, please. Um, the narrative is going to take care of most of this. Um, you're demonstrating your experience. You're setting goals yearly versus one year. And like Christine said, we do need yearly breakdowns. We need yearly budget forms. But nothing's stopping you from doing an overall cumulative showing of what you plan to do through that three years. But absolutely break those down. <clears throat> um, so you obviously you're going to be describing your what you're going to impart to the entrepreneurs and the businesses and demonstration of the experience and qualifications to get that done you're laying out your milestones objectives outcomes of your proposal parameters deliverables through the term of the grant broken down yearly uh, that's a so 25 points this is one of the biggest pieces so recommend recommendations don't leave any points on the table um, maximize it, go through the final rule, go through the NOFO, uh, make sure you're checking every box you can, don't leave anything unturned, explain everything away, um, and you'll be safe. Next slide, please. Um, this is statutory. You must be providing service within three months. Um, there's a lot of leeway here as far as how, but as long as it's you're providing that per your project goals and objectives, then you're fine. Um, and that could be found at, yeah, I'll find that later. Anyway, it is, that's a cannot change kind of thing. So be ready to go within three months. If we're looking at obligating and getting this out before the end of the fiscal year, starting, you know, hopefully around the beginning of fall, you're looking at operational providing service before the end of the calendar year. Uh, please don't hold me to that because things change. We have a lot of folks that need to look at this, look at our recommendations, sign off, approve. Uh, we got to move things to the system. So it could be later than that, but just know from the time of award, three years, three years, three months later, you should be uh, um, getting busy. Next slide, please. Here's another big uh, point getter. Describe the services to entities and locations. So in reverse, you are identifying that which your services and skills to entrepreneurs that you're providing to those identified communities. We're stimulating those economies. We're improving the quality of life. We're raising the level there. We're doing that through the incubator to provide those skills that are necessary in these challenging markets. So please lay all that out. Points are gonna be awarded based on the applicant's ability to provide quality incubation service to a significant number of native businesses and native entrepreneurs. This was laid out in a lot of the comment sections of the final rule. What is significant? What is the definition of significant? And it does change per the capacity, the size. Um, it's not a, the biggest wins by any means. So really spell out how you're gonna be providing that significant number um, in those locations uh, per your capacity. <clears throat> uh, the applicant will have a broad discretion at determining what structure their competitive process will be in selecting participants into their incubator program. 
um, like we covered a couple times in this, make sure that their main focus is those identified reservation communities that are a part of this your pro your project program. Um, although it doesn't have to be exclusive, and determine the appropriate curriculum training and program completion requirements that determine participant graduation. Um, that's going to be great. Three years, it's just going to go quick. So this is another big point. Gary, don't let every, don't leave any points on the table. Next slide, please. Um, so you're describing your reservation community served. Um, again, more does not mean winner. So identify how and how significant that will be. Um, obviously, you're going to be cognizant of the socioeconomic factors of the diverse population, the size, so on and so forth. But we, you do need to identify and you do need, do need to identify how you will be getting into those communities. Um, and then overarching, we understand there's COVID, there's variance and location and, and those issues. So if we need to discuss those at a later date, feel free to ask. But yeah, with this being produced during COVID, I think it was fortunate that uh, we have some of the leeway that we have. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and lastly, the location of the incubator. Uh, this is a must. Yeah, it must have a physical location with space. The applicant does not have to be in possession of it at the time of application, but it must be secured as service as soon as services are provided. So just if you don't have it at the time, just um, include those commitments to have it. Um, you know, temp lease, whatever you're going to be providing, and that should be good. Next slide, please. Um, is this still me, Christine? Yes. Yeah, line yes. item budget and budget narrative. Just seeing if I could punt this over to you. <laughs> uh, points are going to be awarded based on the reasonableness of the proposed IBIT project costs aligned with the type and range of activities and expected outcomes of benefits. Everything needs to align up. Everything needs to be necessary and reasonable. Um, you're going to have a, a center with machines, but does there need to be 100 machines there? You know, I mean, it's got to be, it's all got to make sense. It's got to be necessary. It's got to be reasonable. It's got to align. Uh, with the project goals, with the yearly budget, so everything's got to dance. The application includes a strong plan for oversight of federally awarded funds and activities. You are going to be reporting on the grant funds only. Um, there's a portion of that in the NOFO, as well as the final rule that answers to that if you have any uh, questions. Uh, the budget includes expenses for a, a travel and costs associated with representatives attending or grantee meeting um, that may be in DC. Um, we just will keep you notified uh, when you're awarded and uh, we'll have a big get together and throw down. Next slide, please. Some special notes and these were kind of peppered in through the um, this SAMS. Make sure you have it. You got to have that UEI. You must have a BIA ASAP. One ASAP with another org isn't going to cut it. You have time to get that. Please uh, put your congressional district and uh, where the project is located or where, based on where the project is physically located and um, all that stuff, um, we do need that. Next slide, please. Uh, the NOFO, here's some links. Uh, read the entire NOFO. You'll see that in the FOA as well. Um, where to apply, grants.gov. There's forms to fill out there. And uh, you can fill some of those out online. Uh, to register at grants.gov for any future offerings, uh, there's a link to that and you can um, be on the mailing list for that. Um, next slide. So we're at the kind of the tail end. Um, I really highly recommend reading the act, reading the final rule, go through the comments that were provided during the tribal consultations. Uh, there's a lot there. Some of you were probably, you know, predate us. So some of you could have been on board during the conception of this. So um, you know more about this than we do. So just a couple of questions, Dennis. Um, yeah. Can we provide a link to the final rule? Sure. Uh, myself or somebody will pull that down. Okay. 
And then the last question is, how quickly can we expect to receive approval notice after submission deadline? Oh, this is always uh, such a gray area. We, we hope because there's not gonna be very many, if everybody is submitted in $300,000 ceiling, uh, we're gonna be we thinking about eight to 10, eight. So selecting, getting those through the system, awarding, going through, I mean, it, hopefully it's again by the beginning of fall. Um, so three months or less. Oh, one more question. Um, who can who can participants call and talk to about potential eligibility? I recommend contacting legal counsel. There's the final rule uh, link. Um, legal counsel is the best place to go. Um, talk to the tribe, talk to 638 coordinators, um, reference folks. Uh, again, we wouldn't specifically give that determination. Um, very solicitors, yeah, I would reach out to those those individuals or those entities. Just to clarify, in case it's not clear, that would be your own, um, your own solicitor, your own organizational solicitor. There's not anyone at OIED that can make this determination for you. You can read the NOFO and you can look at the description of what makes an entity eligible. And, and that's where you're going to go ahead and I identify with one of those areas if you do and support the documentation to show that that's where you fit. That's how that works. And it's such a slippery slope just to discuss. I mean, I know it's something simple, but that's just something we don't wanna slide down. Okay, so that's it for questions. So we have a poll um, here just on technical assistance. And if someone could launch that poll, we're just curious to know if there are those of you who would be interested and in we're just trying to get a number here. Um, and either Makana or Elwood is launching this poll for us. I suppose in the meantime, before it comes out, uh, is a really easy way to get technical assistance. We're able to provide that according to the NOFO. So any interpretation you might need with the NOFO, um, any questions you have regarding what you read there, uh, you, you could go on to the Office of Indian Economic Development website and you can um, go to the Division of Economic Development. You'll see an opportunity for pre-application technical assistance. Click on the IBIP link, and then you can fill out the TA request form. And that TA request form looks like the items on the bottom of the slide here. So you'll see, we, we just look for your email, some context around your question, and then we'll get back to you within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you. Christina, it looks like almost 70% of the participants would like to um, receive some technical assistance. So this is the way to get it. Um, please don't hesitate. Is there a chat in the link? Uh, is there a link in the chat? Yes. Okay. So that uh, link to this form is actually in the chat right now, and you can use that as well. And next slide, please. So this is just an opportunity for us to thank everyone for joining us. We hope this uh, webinar was helpful. And I know I see in the chat, um, Jonathan, you're asking about um, as asking questions about making decisions about applying for the grant. Those are difficult for us to provide support with because that's a very um, um, individualized decision about whether to apply or not. It's difficult for us to provide support for that, but 
If you have questions about the funding announcement, if you have questions about the final rule, we would be happy to walk through the information. But as far as making a decision, I know I know it's difficult, but we're not really in a position to process with you about um, whether you should apply or not. But we'll be happy to um, talk to you about what there is. So um, I would say um, thank you to everyone for um, the opportunity for us to share this exciting opportunity to apply for our business incubators. If you have follow-up questions, the technical assistance is available, and um, we hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody. If we could just leave this open for a second in case anyone needs to access that technical assistance link. Um, Elwood, Jonathan oh. was asking how to contact us. I will remain here with the link open to give everyone the opportunity and then give it a few more minutes. So, And then there's one person in the chat that's wondering what the difference is between the final rule and ASAP. I'm answering that one right now. Oh, thanks, Dennis. Just let us know when you're finished and we'll go ahead and close. Say, say that again, Christine. Just let us know when you're finished with your answer and we'll go ahead and close the webinar. Okay.